The early 2010s were an interesting time for the SpongeBob web games on Nick.com. With the fall of the Nick Arcade and the rise of Workin' Man, the site was going through some serious changes. Major projects were coming out, but 2012 had a bittersweet start to it. We said farewell to beloved developers Smashing Ideas and Sarbakin, who had been there from the beginning, but were no longer making games for SpongeBob. And we also said goodbye to MP Game Studio, marking an end to a company with one of the most respectable Flash game catalogs. Now the task of developing SpongeBob games fell primarily on Workin' Man, with some other companies here and there, one of them being GamePill, a popular Canadian studio. They started the year by giving us The Quickster, featuring SpongeBob's persona from the episode Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy 5. The graphics would eventually be redone by Workin' Man in 2015, but for now, let's check it out. You're being chased by a lava flow and have to jump across platforms to collect coins. You can also grab rafts, which you can use to do this. Hey, who does he think he is? Toa Tahu? And the music is amazing. simple concept, but a lot of fun. It's hard to stop playing this. We also have neat little features like these resolutions at the start of the game, and it even keeps track of the distance you run. I like this one a lot. GamePill also made a snake game called Jelly Piper, which also had its graphics updated in 2015. They had a resolution in this one too. The music is interesting. You go around a maze and collect jellyfish to join your trail, avoiding red ones that damage you. And by damage you, I mean kill you instantly. So do the walls. And don't let your line overlap. You have three different modes to choose from, and they essentially determine how fast you go. You might not want to grab the power-up that makes you go faster, because it gets harder to control SpongeBob once you do. They even give you an anchor power-up to make yourself slow again. The developers knew. They knew, and they still gave you this power-up. How evil. But this one's a lot of fun. Though I can never play a stage for too long because I end up dying pretty quickly. Another game pill game that can give you a bit of a challenge is Pizza Perfect. This is a restaurant simulator where an endless amount of health inspectors and some other guys are ordering Krusty Krab pizzas. Oh, because serving pizza at the Krusty Krab went so well the first time. The ingredients are in front of you, so you see what a customer wants and make the pizza accordingly. If you take too long, they get angry. They get so angry they even look upset while they're eating. Take that negativity elsewhere, man. One issue I had with this game is how a single mistake can throw you off for the entire rest of it. If you take too long to give someone their order, it'll throw off the clock and you'll miss every order after it. If only people like this Bumblebee guy could be a little patient. But a less challenging game pill game is squared away. SpongeBob is stacking his outfits, which fit perfectly into a box shape, and you have to make a tower out of them. And look at Gary back here. SpongeBob also has a shockingly tall house. Where is he even dropping these outfits from? Surprised this pineapple doesn't reach the surface of the ocean. But this one's great, and I love trying to make the boxes line up as perfectly as I can. But the last game pill game is Spotless SpongeBob, which is a bit harder. The resolution in this one says, I promise to wash my hands. Yes, please do. I'm very sick while recording this. So this game is all about washing your hands. You control the soap and have to catch germs that are running around on SpongeBob's hand. You have to touch down and unleash a giant circle that bubbles all the surrounding germs, but if you get hit by one, you take damage. This is an issue because they can spawn anywhere, including right beneath you. Then you have no chance to react. I can usually only play this for about 10 seconds before I die. I know this because the game tells you. And here's SpongeBob handing you a bar of soap. Here, take this. You smell bad. But that's gonna do it for Game Pill. They gave us some really good ones, having their own recognizable style that made them stand out. A welcome addition to the website. But aside from them, Working Man was continuing to make the majority of SpongeBob Flash games, and they made a couple in February in honor of Valentine's Day. Let's start with those and work our way through their 2012 catalog. This is Classroom Cupid. You're a Cupid version of SpongeBob and flying through a hallway, bouncing along to this music. <laughs> 
It's sort of like Paperboy, except you have to shoot plungers at the teenagers at the side of the hall. You press Z for the ones in blue and X for the ones in pink. But watch out for jellyfish. You can collect Patrick, though. I imagine everyone's standing at the side of the hall because this freaky sponge is flying around dressed as Cupid and shooting arrows at people. They're looking on in horror before being hypnotized by his plungers. And the invasion of jellyfish must be scary too. It's like having a swarm of extra large bees in your school. Living in Bikini Bottom is scary. But this one's okay, just a little hard to get the hang of. The other Valentine's Day game is a bit more complicated, though. In Valentine's Day Virus, you're plankton and completing missions Karen gives you in a maze. You use the arrow keys to run around, trying to find the exit and often accomplishing some other task in the process. These can include finding pieces of her broken heart or shooting at these enemies that are surprisingly hard to hit. I also love the title screen because things appear whenever you click it. Now that's a neat feature. This game is really detailed and I like playing through it, but as soon as you die, you have to start all over from the very first stage. That makes it hard to make any serious progress, but it's okay. Outside of the Valentine's Day games, Working Man made a whole lot more, and some of them were especially detailed, such as Sandy's Shrubbery Shakedown 2, a sequel to their popular first game. It has so much more to see and do than in the first, including different stages and environments. As Sandy, you throw rocks at acorns to knock them out of a tree. You have to knock them all down before you run out of rocks, so you have to time your shots carefully. You can enjoy watching them bounce around and work their way through obstacles. One location is her tree from the first game, but another is the Flying Dutchman's ship. You get obstacles like these floating barrels and ghosts that appear and block your shots. The rock bottom location is great too, because all sorts of rock bottom residents appear. The music is also great. But if you can't get enough of this, you have a free play mode where you can just throw rocks at nuts to your desire. It's amazing how much they expanded on their original concept, and there's so much to do in this. But Working Man made a much simpler Sandy game that I unfortunately haven't been able to run correctly. In Showtime Squirrel, Sandy is famous and running along a red carpet while fish take pictures of her. Looks like she won an award too. But don't tell Patrick. You have to gather trophies and avoid paparazzi. This is what the game is supposed to look like. It also has the same music from Dance and Tentacles. This is alright, but simple. But it wasn't the only trophy-themed game Workin' Man made this year. Pile the Prize was about fitting all of SpongeBob's trophies in a box. You do this by turning them as they fall, getting them to fit perfectly inside. They're all in different shapes, so you have to fit them accordingly. It's really easy, and the stages end before it gets too hard. Another simple one is Colossal Chaos, where you're in what appears to be a giant trophy, and Plankton is bombing you. You can jump on his cannonballs to give yourself a boost. You collect much smaller trophies and avoid the obstacles. It's alright. But moving on to a more complicated one, SpongeBob Super Sponge Bomber Multiplayer was an intense game of battleship where you could fight against either the computer or another player. At least this time, we don't have to send emails back and forth for each move. The characters are Admiral Squarepants and Captain Patrick Lustar. Unfortunately, the size of each ship is really just there to determine how big of a target it is, since all of them go down in one hit. The game is okay, though. The animation is really intense to look at. You can feel the stakes through the look in SpongeBob's stubbly face. But let's move on. Another interesting game is Patrick's Tartar Tantrum. It's a SpongeBob version of the Virtual Boy game Mario Clash. It even has the graphics to resemble it. Who wouldn't want to play a SpongeBob game on the Virtual Boy? So you go around spilling tartar sauce on these snails to make them go away. Then you kick them to send them flying. They fly down one of these hotel hallways and hit other snails. The game does run really slowly though, but I like the concept. One that runs normally, however, is Hello Bikini Bottom, a rhythm game based on the episode of the same name. You control SpongeBob and Squidward as they perform in a series of different concerts like the ones in the episode. You just hit the correlating keyboard keys at the right time to score as many points as you can. It's actually not that hard, even in the later stages when things start to pick up. Just keep your fingers on the respective keys the entire time and press the right ones as you need to. It's good. 
But another game based on an episode was The Hunt for Grandpappy Redbeard's Treasure, slightly based on Grandpappy the Pirate. This was made as part of a collab with Pirate's Booty, a brand that released official Spongebob-sponsored corn puffs. They would later collab again during Sponge Out of Water, so they must have really liked this brand. You could even get a code from one of the bags. Take a wild guess as to what it was. But unfortunately, the stage it unlocked doesn't work anymore. This is a simple platformer where you go around a ship. The screen is scrolling behind you, so you have to keep moving. You jump on obstacles and grab coins. You can rack up points by jumping on these cannonballs repeatedly. It's also fun to make your way through different platform formations to find bonuses. The stages aren't too different, but this one's pretty fun. A good time for all. But Working Man also released a couple... Stranger games this year. The Castle Challenge duology was certainly an interesting direction for them. In the first one, The Storm, you're trying to storm a castle. You just keep running while everything under the sun comes to attack you. It can be difficult because you have to hit a certain arrow key to make it through every obstacle. Just take a picture of the instructions with your phone so you don't have to remember them all. It's also hard to tell how close you need to be in order for your deflection to work. The sequel, The Escape, is even harder, but the arrow keys are easier to remember. There aren't as many of them, and they actually correlate with the direction the attacks are coming from. You try to escape the castle you raided while riding on Gary, who has a metallic shell. Also, these anchovy princesses are in both of the games. They're amusing. These games are highly difficult and will send you back to the very beginning if you lose, so only play them if you're willing to take on a great challenge. But aside from these, there's one more working man game I'd like to look at before we move on to the other companies. And technically, it isn't even fully a working man game. This is SpongeBob's Next Big Adventures, adapted from SpongeBob's Big Adventures. Both MP Game Studio and Workin' Man are credited with having made this, though MP Game Studio had shut down by the time it came out. This contains everything from the first game, but added a few notable changes, including a new title screen. Fun fact, the Flying Dutchman ship doesn't actually appear in this. So as soon as we start, SpongeBob receives a letter from Sandy. It tells him that Glove Universe is open and she has a surprise for him at the Krusty Krab. The game continues as it did before, but as we can see, we have spaces for collectibles this time. Hey, is that a fairly odd parents reference? So when we go to meet Sandy, she tells us to meet her at her house. Why couldn't she have just sent us there to begin with? But first, we have to get our water helmet. Or fish bowl. That seems like a derogative term in Bikini Bottom, don't you think? But Patrick is stuck in it. I guess because he's totally never worn one of these before. So we go to Jellyfish Fields to get Jelly and slide him out. Then it's off to Sandy's. She says she has a surprise for us in her tree. This is because a guard worm scared the mailman up there. Hey, I get it. Sandy's worm scared me as a kid too. At least when it became a butterfly. So we get a cool minigame where we climb the tree and avoid branches, grabbing as many envelopes as we can. We're only here for our mail, but stealing other people's is fun too. There are so many branches that they're hard to avoid, but you don't have to climb very far to win. Just see how high you can get. Afterwards, you give the mail to Sandy, who reveals that she has tickets to Glove Universe from the episode Glove World R.I.P. This was a big episode that came out that year, so what better way to advertise it? Heading to Glove Universe, we meet the suspicious man and glove mascot who are running it. We head inside and find this highly interactive area. I see the stands are run by the same incidental. He needs money for chocolate. In the first one, Balloon Pop, you have to align two darts with a balloon you want to pop. Then you try to burst three in a row. You can do better. Yeah, thanks. Really needed a Spongebob game to tell me that. The other stand is Seahorse Race. You choose a seahorse from a selection and mash the heck out of your spacebar to make it race the others. You actually have to mash really hard. I'm good at button mashing, but even I struggled with this. But the other feature we have here is the shop. Here you can buy decorations for your house. These features are cool, but for now, we have to continue the story by going in the Tunnel of Glove. Sandy is kidnapped, so you have to find her. This glove mascot will only let you through the door if you win him prizes in the games. Then you find the park owner, who has Sandy in a cage and wants to display her as a carnival attraction. Come on, I'm sure the Bikini Bottomites are used to seeing a squirrel among them. So you get a super easy boss fight where you sling rocks at the park owner until he's defeated. Then Sandy gets free and you put him on display. You can also put the things you buy on display. How neat. This game did a good job of expanding on the original and adding a bunch of new things to do. This whole project was almost a sort of swan song for MP Game Studio. It still remains one of the most beloved games on Nick.com. This right here is also the best iteration of it. That's because a later version, which would be called SpongeBob's Next Big Adventure rather than Adventures, would take some stuff out. 
I guess he's only going on one adventure in this one. For one, some environments aren't as detailed, and as you can see, our display options are gone. Yeah, the shop was unfortunately removed. But the change that seemed to upset people the most was the removal of the original Tundra stage. It was likely taken out for more comfortable mobile compatibility. Rather than going through a difficult platformer to thaw your friends who are frozen in ice, now you just kinda run and jump over snowballs and collect them. Yippee! Then the snow mollusk appears and you throw jelly beans at it. What's strange is that in the original game, Patrick would poke in to throw jelly beans for you to sling. He doesn't do that anymore, but the animation of him coming in to do it is still in the game. So now Patrick just pokes his head in for no reason. Yeah, a bit of a strange change. But no matter what changes came to this game, Big Adventures and Next Big Adventures will always remain legendary additions to Nick.com and brilliant pieces of MP Game Studios' legacy. But another big game also came out this year, but an even greater tragedy befell it. 2012 saw the release of a game collection called the Super Spongy Square Games, based on a big marathon that aired in July. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find it anywhere online. The games included in it were hook jumping, trench diving, thumb wrestling, and bait lifting. Hopefully this can be recovered one day, but until then, we need to move on. So now that we're done with the Workin' Man games, let's conclude this year by looking at the ones made by two other companies. This first one is called Guinness O' Ripley's Extreme Arcade of World Records, which we'll review for our 10,000 subscriber special. It was made by 7-2, a remarkable company that usually made games for the website. They previously made Mystery Train, which was really cool. But this was a compilation of minigames based on the episode Squirrel Record. Each of them were based on world records Sandy tried to complete in the episode. But this time, all the Spongebob characters are trying to beat them. There's one where you have to stretch Sandy's tongue as far as you can get it, one where you're Patrick and trying to catch Chum Plankton is spewing from a hose, one where you milk cobras by clicking on their fangs as they glow, one where you're trying to match rows of three matching blocks, and one where you're Gary in a game of Breakout. The last one, Chainsaw Juggler, is locked behind a code. But in it, you're Mr. Krabs and you're juggling chainsaws. Now that's awesome. These games are all great, and the arcade style really sells it. It's a unique take on the episode, but a really good one. You can kill a lot of time trying to set world records of your own in each of these. But now to conclude, let's check out the games made by one company in particular. This year brought a new developer to the Spongebob scene, and they sure made a lot for us to check out. Please welcome Splashworks. No, not the water park. In honor of spring, all of their games were spring-themed and had the word spring in the title. Made it easy to recognize their work. This first one is Spring Training, which is a mix between Slam and Sluggers and Gary's Crush. SpongeBob is swinging a bat at a baseball and trying to send it as far as he can. You have to click at the right time to set your level of power and the angle you want the ball to fly at. Then you send it flying and bouncing on a series of objects that affect how it flies. You can even activate Squid Ink to make it bounce for a while. Most of the things you can hit will also make it bounce farther, but my favorite is this green jellyfish that just takes it and flies with it for a while. Then it just drops it wherever, possibly making you lose. Such a gamble. But this is fun enough. But Spring It On is a much stranger one. Look at this creepy guy on the menu. Alien fish have invaded Bikini Bottom and are eating all the plants. Only they didn't realize it was Earth Day. Spring it on. I love how this insinuates that Earth Day is a day where everyone goes out and fights for the fate of the planet. If they had chosen to eat the plants on any other day, it would have been fine. So you have plants that shoot exploding seeds, and you have to click to destroy each of the aliens as they fly in. You also kill jellyfish for bonus points. Now you may be wondering why we kill the jellyfish, even though they're a part of nature. Doesn't that go against everything Earth Day is about? Well, according to Charles Oscar William Piedmont Augustus Winthrop, the biologist, jellyfish are also an alien species, so that's good enough for me. This is fun because you mess up the screen a little more with every alien you kill. You can make an absolute mess of a battlefield in this. It's a little crude in its design, but I still enjoy it. Now to do the opposite of making a mess, this is spring cleaning. It's a little more difficult. You're in your absolute junkyard of a house and sliding across a grid. You have to avoid jellyfish and collect all the junk, so you strategize to figure out the best pattern to slide in. It's hard, but good if you like challenging games like this. 
Another challenging one is Spring Into Action, which is actually a platformer. You have to reach Patrick, who's much smaller than you, by spawning different ledges to jump on so you can get to his. You also need to avoid obstacles and sometimes collect items before you can get to him. You have to use different platforms as they're needed, but even still, it can be hard to accomplish what you're trying to do. If a bouncy platform is just a little off, you can't utilize it. It's unfortunate that there are a good few stages, but dying sends you back to the very beginning. It makes it hard to make any serious progress. But you can try to memorize the patterns you used before so you can do them again. It's decent enough. But this last one is my favorite, even though it's a lot simpler. Spring Showers is a very interesting take on the Line Rider concept where... Sand is leaking into your house? Are you underground? But you have to work through stages with different obstacles and designs to lead the falling sand into a bucket. You have to get a certain number of grains in each bucket for it to be complete. You can have a lot of fun with the lines you draw in this. This is really amusing. I have way too much of a good time just messing around. Good job, Splashworks. But all of their games are nice to play through and made for a welcome change of pace on Nick.com. Along with all the other games that came out this year, these helped to make 2012 a special time for SpongeBob Flash games. There were a lot of creative additions to the library, and many of them are nice to go back to. Well, as long as they work, that is. With big games such as Sandy Shrubbery Shakedown 2 and SpongeBob's Next Big Adventures, Nick.com was a good place to be for children growing up in the 2010s. Working Man 7-2 Splashworks and Game Pill made this a remarkable year, and the greatness would continue as the decade pressed on. We still have a lot more to get through, so I hope you're ready for the rest of this wild ride. Be sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter and Twitch, which are linked in the description below, and tune in to our next installment. Thank you for joining me. I will see you in the next memory.